what's going on, everybody? We are, as I said, excited. Welcome aboard. Uh, we know this is a free event monetarily, but it's certainly not free in terms of your time. So we are going to use your time wisely. Shar, take it away. Yeah, well, happy Friday, everyone. Good afternoon. And I'm going to say Happy New Year. We can say that all the way through January. Um, it is my privilege today to welcome you all to our 2024 CPA exam roadmap webinar hosted by myself, Charlotte Roberts, my colleague, Quinn Perkson, and of course, the none other than Mr. Peter Alento. So as Let's you go. all know, we're ready. It's Friday. I think the music fired Peter up here. Um, as you all know, the old CPA exam is gone. The new 2024 exam it is finally here, and in fact, it made its big debut last Wednesday, January 10th. With the new exam comes a wide variety of different decisions and choices that you're going to have to navigate, such as which part to sit for first, navigating the testing windows, and I think the big question that a lot of folks are joining us here today for is, which discipline do I choose and how do I choose the right fit for me? So definitely strap on your seatbelts. You're gonna get answers to those questions plus learn a whole of a lot more by joining us today. So next slide, Matt. Um, a quick reminder before we get started that Peter, Quinn and myself, we are three representatives on behalf of a much larger team here at UWorld all dedicated to ensuring your future success. We have over the past 20 years helped over 2 million students successfully study and pass a wide variety of high stakes exams. We do this with approach, which Quinn was gonna show later towards the webinar, of really taking the most difficult concepts on those high stakes exams and making them exceptionally easy for our students to understand. The next slide, specifically within accounting and finance, as you'll see here, we've made a huge investment the past five over the past five years, starting with the acquisition of Roger CPA Review. So Peter's joining uh, Roger Phillip as one of our lecturing team here within the CPA Review product. Last year, the acquisition of Wiley Efficient Learning. And then again, last July, last July Peter joining the UWorld family. So you take all that to the power of UWorld, as I mentioned, and we really have exceptional products and an experience for our accounting and finance candidates. Specifically within CPA review, you'll see here our goal is the time that you spend with us. Of course, we got to get you to pass the CPA exam, but we also want to teach you a whole bunch of concepts and um, approaches that you're going to take on with you well into your career. So we're going to get you exam ready and career ready. Our students and candidates are passing the CPA exam three times faster with our Smart Path Predictive Technology and our proven 94% CPA exam pass rate. But again, you're going to learn a little bit more about that secret sauce with Quinn more towards the end. So to get us started, it is my pleasure to introduce you all to Peter Alinto. But I would say at this point, I don't think we need a whole lot of introduction since he DJ opened us today. Um, Peter's joining us today with over 30 years of experience teaching both the CFA and CPA exam prep. He passed all four parts of the CPA exam and CFA prep um, on his first attempt. He began his career at Deloitte in audit and then also as a former tax attorney for ENY. In addition, founded his own law practice specializing in tax, real estate, and estate planning. So needless to say, Peter definitely knows his stuff. So I'm excited that Peter is here to share his advice with you. And with that, Peter, I'm going to turn the keys over to you to drive it from here. Sure. Thank you so much. What's happening, everybody? Again, welcome aboard. Uh, most important thing I can say about the credentials and the letters is that uh, none of these exams require a high IQ, and I've proved that to be true. So you've heard of Jack of all trades. I'm his cousin Pete. Um, so look, if I pass any of these exams, you can and you will. Slow and steady wins the race. Straight A's are not a prerequisite. You just need to make the commitment and be like, hey, this is going to change the trajectory of the rest of my life, not only financially and in terms of your career, but even personally. Obviously, if you like what you do and you're happy in what, what you do, you know what? You're more likely to uh, just overall feel better about yourself and your life. So look, I tell people who are studying for the CPA, you got to look at the CPA exam the same way law students look at the bar exam. It's unheard of to go three years to law school and not pass the bar. So there's uh, an incredible uh, uh, a commitment, uh, put together an excellent plan to make sure you pass the bar, otherwise you can't practice law. Obviously the CPA, a lot of people see it as a luxury, it's absolutely not. Now with five years, 150 credit hours, all the time and money you've invested, 
to get your degree in accounting, how could you not finish the job and get your CPA? I will say while I am a very, very proud CPA, I will admit I did not grow up wanting to be a CPA. So it's not about our love of accounting and debits and credits, obviously not. The vast majority of us, I would think if we hit the lotto tonight, we would uh, <laughs> we'd be on a beach in Hawaii somewhere tomorrow and uh, retiring. But look, it's gonna open doors for you the rest of your life. It's self-evident if you're in public accounting and you're working in a public accounting firm, a lot of those firms will not promote you, some not even to senior, most not till manager. And um, you know, so you, your, your opportunities within the firm are gonna dry up if you're not a CPA. Outside of public accounting, if you start in public accounting, talk to anybody who's gone that route, yes, the hours are long, but I don't know any lawyer, doctor, or anybody remotely successful who didn't inherit the money that's not working hard. But uh, you know, you put in a couple of years, you get that work experience, you have your CPA, you talk to people, the headhunters will be calling you off the hook. So uh, regardless of which way your career takes you, you will never regret putting in the time and effort to get certified. So uh, just a couple of things on the front end, knowing the CPA exam basics, just don't want to take anything for granted. We'll go through quickly content format, the core versus the disciplines. Uh, we're here a lot to give you some advice on maybe which discipline you want to select. Um, the efficient study habits, you know, what makes somebody successful in preparing for the CPA, CFA, the bar, I mean, they're just exams with a ton of information. That volume of information, how does anybody remember all that stuff exam day? Well, as I mentioned, slow and steady, we're gonna give you some tips to help you out through that. So uh, Matt, if you would, if we could uh, flip to the next slide there. So everyone's taking three parts of the CPA exam, as you all know. So the accounting is the historical financial accounting, pretty much what you saw in intermediate one, intermediate two the basic fundamental audit that everyone has to take, whether you want to do tax or consulting, whatever you want to do, everyone's taking their basics and audit. And then tax, when the average person on the street hears you're a CPA, what do they immediately expect you to be an expert in? Tax. So everyone, regardless if you go the audit route or not, you have to have a basic understanding of tax. So the core parts are, uh, you know, been tested for a long time, not a lot of changes there. I'll go through some detail there. But, um, you know, the, I'll give you a little advice on the time and effort you can possibly plan when studying for these different parts, but it's very dependent upon your unique circumstances. Like, are you still in school right now? What did you use those 30 credit hours, those electives on? Did you take, you know, golf? Or did you actually take an additional class in tax or governmental? Are you out of school 15 years? Well, you're an A student, a C student, I don't know. So there's a range in the time but you wanna plan for success and making sure you're gonna put in the time necessary to pass. The three disciplines, somebody at the AICPA said, hey, we got a pipeline problem. Why don't we make one of the parts you know, optional that people get to choose which one? And I, I bet you a lot of people will start majoring in accounting. <laughs> you gotta love it. But somebody thought, and you know what? I, the 150 credit hours aside, it's not a bad thing to make one of the four parts at your option, depending upon, well, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna go audit? Are you an IT person or are you a tax person? So that's pretty cool that you get to choose that. Um, you know, a, a big thing with the adaptive and flexible, I gotta tell you, a criticism of the CPA exam for decades was that it was too academic in nature, that someone could have, you know, five years of experience in audit and yet have no advantage on the audit section of the exam because it was too academic. They didn't reward your training and experience, that's done. So when we put together the potential order, theoretically the AICPA you know, said, listen, if you're in audit and you've been doing that for a number of years, you should perform better on that section of the exam. And then the same thing would be true for tax. All righty, so let's flip to the next slide, please, Mad. ISC, hell no, not me. This was not the discipline I'd be taking. I am not the IT guru. It took me an hour to sign on today's webinar. Are you kidding me? But what is tested on ISC? So look, if you're an audit professional and you've got, um, you know, maybe a minor in IT or maybe, uh, you know, this is where you have a passion. Well, this is going to be the discipline for you. All right. So you got what's called SOC reports. A lot of people don't even know what that stands for if you're not an IT person, but the system organizational controls, there's a SOC 1, SOC 2, IT risk management, IT and data governance, cybersecurity, privacy frameworks. Specifically, the point value is the information systems and data management 
that's about half, almost half, 35 to 45%. The security, the privacy, the confidentiality, 35 to 45%. And then the SOC engagements are about 15 to 25. So you could see that everything's pretty much on a sliding scale. But you know what? If you're an audit person, this might be a potential path for you, depending upon whether or not you have that passion for IT. Next slide, please. So the audit folks, what are the accounting roles related to if you got that audit and in that IT passion? Well, first of all, everyone, those extra 30 credit hours, everyone, do you realize now IT is embedded in every section of the exam to a certain extent because it's just integral in everything we do, whether you're doing tax or consult, doesn't matter. So everyone, those extra 30 credit hours, if you still have the opportunity, take an additional class in IT, all right? But if information systems is your thing, IT advisory services, data solutions, internal controls, business continuity, whatever it may be, then this is going to be, for a lot of audit folks, this will be the discipline you'll want to sit for. Next slide, please. The bar. This is where I'd be going, baby, the bar. Not only just after this like webinar, but just like this is the discipline I would like, the bar. You ready? So for audit people that are not IT folks, this is probably what your employer as well would want to see you sit for in terms of a discipline. That's right. Employers may want to have some say in this, but there's a lot of technical accounting here. So most of your business co combinations, your consolidations, do you have significant influence, no significant influence? Do you have control, special purpose entity, variable interest entity? Should they be consolidating so we have a better understanding of the risk and performance? Derivative and hedge accounting, forward, futures, options, swaps, not only calculating the price, the value, but how do we account for that? I think I'm going to have a gain. I think I'm going to have a loss. Pension accounting, that's right. Employee benefit plans, both the traditional, you know, where your, your employer is going to take care of you the rest of the life. Like who, who does that anymore, right? So maybe some uh, state and local government positions, but for the most part, we're on our own with our own 401ks but the old fashioned defined benefit versus defined contribution. And then lastly, data analytics, what they call visualization. So uh, this is what's on the bar section. So if you're not a tax person, you're not, not an IT person, bar's the way to go. Specifically the point value, business analysis, 40 to 50%. Technical accounting, like the pensions, consolidations, derivatives, revenue recognition, 35 to 45. And then the state and local governments, barely tested on the core financial accounting. The vast majority of that is tested here on the bar exam. So the state and local governmental 10 to 20%. So the accounting rolls when you're at the bar. Well, next slide, please, Matt. Again, please folks, use your electives wisely. So those extra 30 credit hours, everyone should take a class in governmental not-for-profit. Multiple universities where I taught, it was either an elective or maybe a couple of weeks in um, advanced accounting. Some schools, it's not even an elective. But why would you want to take it? Do you realize behind the public accounting firms and corporate America, one of the largest employers of CPAs in the U.S., the government, state, local, everyone's got CPAs. So that's a potential career path. And a lot of the public accounting firms have state, local government or not-for-profits as clients. Take a class in financial statement analysis, folks. A lot of what you'll do, not only in the bar section of the exam, but if you've got a particular interest in finance and mixing that with accounting, understanding how do you determine the value of an entity? You know, the stock price, Quinn, do you want to pay $50 a share? Is it worth 70? Is it worth 30? Is it overvalued, undervalued, fairly valued? It's a lot of what you'll do in financial statement analysis, understanding risk, potential return, growth potential, and ultimately value. I've mentioned data analytics. You should take a, certainly think about an elective there. And then corporate finance for people who have this technical accounting expertise. And then maybe you want to combine it with, uh, you know, you know, the CMA route or the CFA route. It's wonderful to have that background in corporate finance to be able to advise an entity. Hey, here's what you're going to invest. Here's what I think the potential value of that is, the net present value or your internal rate of return, whatever it may be. So advisory services, financial analysis, financial operations, management, governmental accounting. You're thinking about going into corporate America. It's a no-brainer. Next slide, please. TCP, yeah, you know me. So you're a tax professional. You're loving the tax. What's tested on TCP? 
Well, first of all, identifying taxable and non-taxable transactions, multi-jurisdictional taxation, uh, tax implication, business formation. Should I be an S corp, a C corp, an LLP, an LLC? Hell no, not me. I don't know. So there's the advantages and disadvantages of different forms of doing business. And then really the analyzing tax alternatives to maximize your wealth. Now, legal tax avoidance is fine. We want to avoid the tax evasion, which is illegal, but tax planning. So folks, historically, and even currently today, the reg section is a lot of compliance, filling out your 1040, 1065, 1120, whatever it is. But tax compliance and planning, personal financial planning, that's 30 to 40% of TCP. That, that's phenomenal because that's a whole opportunity outside of just crunching returns to make the money giving the advice. You've got the entity tax compliance, another potential 30 to 40%, but even entities want to do some tax planning, 10 to 20%. And then your property transactions, another 10 to 20%. Next slide, please, Matt. So folks, if you don't like the audit, you think you want to go audit, and then you decide, I don't like audit so much. I hear the tax professionals are working less hours and making more money. You want to switch into audit, folks, it's going to be very difficult for you to make a credible argument at your firm to switch into the tax department if you don't have multiple classes in taxation. So please do yourselves a favor. Even though you think you like audit, what if you don't? And when the average person hears you're a CPA, they're going to expect you to be an expert in tax. Take multiple classes in tax as well as financial planning. If you want to be a tax consultant, having a CPA, and maybe you have a master's in taxation or a CPA and a law degree, like I thought I was going to go that route, or CPA and CFP, a certified financial planner, there's so many things you could do. In addition to the obvious tax preparer, financial advisor, you may want to move into wealth management. A lot of level three on the CFA exam is planning for high net worth individuals. How do they minimize their tax obligations and maximize their wealth? And then obviously the tax audit side as well. So, so many fantastic opportunities. Next slide, please. All righty. So here are your three core and your three potential disciplines. Let me start off, first of all, by telling you audit for the most part is theory based. So it's inherently a little bit easier to study, not an easier exam, easier to study because without the math intensive nature of financial or tax you could or bar, you could just move through the review a little bit faster. So audit the core, probably 80 to 100 hours, but depending, when did you take that audit class? Did you get an A, did you get a C, those sorts of things. The far core, kind of like a final exam for intermediate one, intermediate two, intro to financial, 120 to maybe 160 hours. Are you out of school 15 years or five minutes? Did you get A's in intermediate or did you get some B's and C's? Not a big deal. You can do it. We don't presume prior knowledge, okay? So we're going to teach you what you need to know. But again, that sliding scale, the reg core, which is not only the individual tax and some entity tax, but also business law. The business law, straightforward, like the audit, no math involved, but very voluminous. You want to save all your wrong answers for the tax because the business law is no excuse to get that stuff wrong. But the reg core, you know, you're probably looking 120 to 150 hours, depending upon, again, your background in tax and how you did in your business law classes. The bar discipline, that's more like your intermediate and then advanced accounting. 120 to 160 hours, you should probably budget. ISC, mostly theory based, where hearing is very repetitive in terms of the content maybe 100 to 120 hours. And then if you go in the tax discipline, again, depending upon your background and your grades in tax, 120 to 150 hours. Teslets one and two, all of these exams, except for ISC, because it's mostly theory-based, a lot of remembering and memorization, that has a 60-40 split between the multiple choice and task-based simulations. But every other section of the CPA exam is a 50-50 split. Four hour exam, it's a mental marathon, approximately two hours on the multiple choice, approximately two hours on the task based simulation, no more adaptive nonsense with the multiple choice, none of that stuff. So, you first of all, when you study, generally what people do is they watch the lecture first. And unlike some, you know, we, we're not reading PowerPoints to you, it's not what we do, it's horrible. Just going through the concepts, you got to put the pen to the paper. You got to write. It's math. We do a back and forth approach. We introduce the concept, we practice it. Introduce the concept, we practice it. So it's very engaging. 
but you generally watch the lecture, do your multiple choice, feel very comfortable with the subject matter, then you'll move on to your task-based simulations because task-based simulations can be very challenging even if it were open book because it's this flood of information. You get all this given information, all these exhibits. Oh my God, what do I do? How do I set it up? We're gonna take good care of you, but you generally, that's kind of on the back end as you feel more comfortable with the subject matter. There's also good tips we're gonna give you like task-based simulations. Like, you know, there could be two or three problems within an individual testlet, you know? Uh, what order do you do those in when you open up that testlet? Whatever order you feel more, most comfortable with in terms of level of difficulty, you leave the hardest topic in that testlet for last. Because if you're gonna rush and run out of time, Let's rush and run out of time on something you probably weren't going to do well in, right? It's just logical. Okay, next slide, please. All right, continuous testing. Uh, for those of you who've already been sitting for the exam, you pretty much could sit year round. No longer the case, folks. No longer the case. So we've got a bit very different animal today. Your core test dates by quarter, you have about six weeks, right? In these in the four quarters throughout the year. And there's a long time lag until you get your results. So what does that mean for you? We used to tell people, God forbid you fail. First of all, it's not the end of the world because the vast majority of CPAs did not, I repeat, did not pass all four parts on the first attempt. That's totally fine. But when you fail a part, you're gonna kind of flip your studies. We'll give you a lot of guidance where instead of starting with the lectures, now nah, I think I'm gonna start with the problems and the multiple choice and then selectively watch lectures where are more deficient, but it happens. The difference today is you used to get your results in two weeks. So we used to tell people, if you fail a part, you've only started studying two weeks for your next part, let it go. Uh, excuse me, let that part go and go back and retake what you just studied, you know, go back and, and it's while it's fresh in your mind. Now you've got a long time lag. So if you get your results and you failed a part, you know what, let it go for now. Keep studying with what you've been working on because you're not gonna get your results for such a long period of time. You're not gonna be two weeks into studying for your next part. You'll probably be two months in to studying for your next part, okay? Your disciplines, the window is only open for about a month, about four weeks in each quarter. And again, there's a long time delay. They gotta make sure, look, that the you know people aren't passing at an 80% rate or a 20% rate statistically. They got to get a volume of exams and make sure you know the bell curve and all that kind of stuff is where they want it to be. The raw score, folks, throw that out the window. People say, oh, I need a 75. I don't think so. You know, our practice exams, you know, it's a raw score, right? 75%. You know, for them, it's not. You know, it's scale. That's why it takes so long to see. Uh, you know what? That the raw score might be 70. I don't know. But the bottom line is, you know, you've got to give yourself enough time to be properly prepared for each part you cannot cram. So when I was talking about those number of hours for each and every section, folks, you're not studying, you know, a piece of people say, oh, Peter, you said 160 hours. I took two weeks off and, and studied 80 hours a week. That's not the way to do it. It's a marathon, not a sprint. You will learn about the law of diminishing marginal returns if you try to cram too much in two weeks. So plan your studies based upon this new format when the court, you can do this in any order. It would be, in my opinion, generally foolish to start with the discipline because the discipline is the capstone to the core, right? So it's logical you take intermediate before you take advanced, but you could do whatever you want. Next slide, please. All righty, specific advice on exam order. You all heard of LIFO accounting, FIFO, you're about to learn HIFO. Hardest one in, first one out, all right? Hardest one in, because look, I always hear story. We all hear stories of people who are up for manager, can't get promoted because they don't have the exam out of the way. And more often than not, they've passed parts, but then they lost credit for it because they didn't finish the remaining parts with what used to be the 18 month window, which is now moving to 30 months. You can't have that happen. And because they want to reward work experience, that's going to factor into the planning of what the order in which you sit for the parts. So as a general rule of thumb, and there are multiple ways to get to the finish line. This is not the only way, but all things being equal. If you're an audit person, what's not going to be something you're probably going to see day in and day out? Tax. So the red core is probably something you want to do on the front end and or the financial. I don't care if you do financial first, then reg or the reg, then the financial. 
you're not going to see that day in, day out. The longer you're out of school, the harder that's going to be to pass. So let's get that done while it's relatively fresh in your mind. The other thing is the 18 month window is not for all four parts or 30 month. It's not for all four. You have as much time as you want for the first part because the window doesn't start to close until you've passed your first part. So whatever part you think is going to give you the most anxiety in terms of level of difficulty based upon your performance in school and your background, get that out of the way first. For So a lot of people audit folks far reg or reg far. After you do those two, now let's say you're working, you're getting training. The audit core is going to be a lot easier for you because it's what you do for a living. And then your capstone will either be the ISC if you're an IT person or the bar. So those sections of the exam, the audit, and then depending upon whether you go ISC or bar, because of your work experience and training, that should get relatively easier. And God forbid you're up against the window, the 18 or 30 months, whatever it may be. You can't cram for your weakest part. You can't. That's going to cause you the most stress because you did your easy parts on the front end. And if you're working full time, you got to plan ahead. What could you realistically absorb while you're working 50, 60 hours a week? Tax folks, FAR or audit. So on the front end, probably FAR, then audit, or maybe audit, then FAR. It depends how much you hate audit. I don't know. But FAR audit, some combination there in first and second. I would say the FAR first because it's math intensive and takes so much longer to study for than the audit on average because audit is theory, as I mentioned. Then I would go the reg core and then the TCP. Again, all your work experience and training is going to pay dividends, man. So be smart on the front end. Now, some people say, Pete, I need confidence. I want to pass my easiest part first. Hey, listen. There's a lot of ways to get to the finish line. If you're hell bent on doing that, we're not saying not to do that. But on average, all things being equal, this is what makes sense to us, okay? Next slide, please. All right, folks, that 30 month rule, not every state, but most states, you know what state you're in. So have they changed, you know, the, 30, the uh, 18 to the 30 months? I don't care if it's 18 or 30. First part, you could take as much time as you want. We know that. You're a working professional, you could pass this exam. You're probably gonna have to study though only maybe 10 hours a week, about 40 hours a month. All right, so that's three to four months to get in the 120 to 160. You could do 10 hours a week, you know, for the most part, even if you're working Saturdays, you could do six, seven hours on a Sunday. And then look, don't just study the weekends. Be active every day. So Monday through Thursday, get up an hour earlier. Get it out of the way first. It's like going to the gym, right? If you wait till the end of the day, it's on your mind all day. It's like you did five workouts by the time it's seven o'clock at night. Bang it out first thing in the morning, get it over with. You say, hey, Pete, I got 15 hours a week. All right, 60 hours a month, two to three months, not so bad. Or you're only working part-time and you're finishing up your extra 30 credit hours. 20 hours a week, 80 hours a month, two months. But don't try to cram this into two weeks, all right, whatever you do. But look, man, there's a lot of different paths you can go depending upon the time you have available. And my college students, man, while you're getting those extra 30 credit hours, if you choose, stay away from the golf and that crap. Get the governmental, the additional tax, the corporate finance, the financial statement analysis. You're studying it in school and then reviewing it for the CPA exam. Shit, your grades aren't going to suffer. They're going to be that much better because of the additional review you're getting with us. And it's fresh in your mind. Use those credits wisely. Next slide, please. All right. What state are you going to get licensed in? Ask your employer. Whoever is employing you is probably going to have a big say in that because if you're getting, you know, you're going to do audits in New York, I'm going to guess they want you to be licensed in the state of New York. Some firms, though, initially, you know, truthfully, the state you're licensed in, assuming your employer is neutral about it out of the gate. That matters when you're a manager someday or a partner and you want to sign off on something. Then you got to be lawfully licensed in that state. But that's way down the road. If your employer is neutral, shop for a state that's best for you. Who will let you sit at 120 versus 150? Hey, they don't require residency. Well, that's cool. So then it might be a lot easier to sit for the exam in that state, get licensed in that state, and then eventually apply for reciprocity. But for most new hires, your employer is going to have some say. So we to defer to them. But if your employer is neutral, talk to us, baby. We know the states that are going to be relatively easier in terms of the number of credit hours to be eligible, et cetera. Work experience, one to two years. 
application and fees. That's what we do. We got a whole team that'll hold your hand through that process in whatever state you want to sit for the exam. And by the way, you can physically sit for the exam in any state you want. Where you get licensed, that depends upon where you mail the money. You can physically sit for the exam in any state you want. All righty. Ethics exam, some states yes, some states no. Uh, you know, international, hey, you got a whole set of different issues and will they take my credits for this? You need background now in U.S. tax, U.S. business laws. I, you probably know IFRS. Now you got to learn U.S. GAAP. Talk to us. We got an international team around the world that'll say, hey, if you're from India or you're from the Middle East, we know your background. This is probably the best credits for you to take to get ready to get your 120 or 150. Here's the best state for you to submit your application to. We'll do all that legwork for you. All right, next slide, please. Quick tips. Are you ready? Are you ready? How am I doing on time? I don't want Matt. Matt, you're not going to. Matt, are you mad at me, Mad? It's Madeline. We call her Mad because off the top, she's <laughs> mad, especially at me. How am I doing, Mad? You're doing great, Pete, and uh, we're great on time, and no, I'm not mad, but I think we're actually at the point where we're transitioning over to Quinn. Oh, you're doing the tips, Quinn? No, I think I'm doing the tips, or are you doing the tips? Oh, you are. Sorry. I'm sorry. You're correct. You're correct. Apology I'm not accepted. Add me to the broken hearts you collected. <laughs> That's oh. right. right. Apologies. Right. That's right. We're at the tip portion. <laughs> All right. You ready? Start early, folks. As I mentioned, it's not a mar it's not a sprint, okay? It's a marathon. So you cannot cram for anything, not the regular course or your final review. Folks, you can't people tell me, hey Pete, I'm taking chapter 10 on Friday. I'll be finished. I'll be ready for the exam on Monday. Absolutely not. You need to set up your study plan such that you have the two months or three months or four months, whatever you think you need. Plan ahead. God forbid you get sick, something happens at work cumulative reviews along the way, which I'll talk more about. But when you finish the course first time through, hey, you got to leave at least two weeks on the back end to do a thorough final review. All right. Otherwise, it's if, if you try to cram this, this information overload and you again, diminishing marginal returns, you try to study more than eight hours a day. You ain't getting much out of the ninth and 10 hour. You're just not. We do have candidates that will study full time, four hours in the morning, nice long break, and then practice questions for another four hours in the evening. But man, anything more than eight hours a day is not gonna be worth it or, or productive, okay? So plan ahead, start early, give yourself extra time, plan ahead for sickness, work, family, whatever it may be. And by the way, you should tell your family, leave you the hell alone. You know, you wanna be a CPA or do you wanna be popular, right? And forget about working out all that much, don't work out, you look at Quint, he doesn't mind, so listen, this is not the time to be, not the time to be, I'm sorry, quit. It's not time to be worried about working out, all right? Don't spend a lot of time in the shower. Do you want to smell good or be a CPA? Keep your priorities straight. Tip number two. As I was mentioning, folks, practice. The order in which you do things, you got to be very proficient in the subject matter before you go to the task-based simulation. So we start with the multiple choice, but it's not the volume of questions. People say, I worked hundreds of questions, but what did you get out of those questions? Did you learn from your mistakes? Did you not only understand why the right answer was right, but you know those wrong answers? Why, why were they there? How could they try to trick me exam day? And if you got it right, but it took you 10 minutes, guess, guess what? On average, you don't have 10 minutes of questions. You got a minute and a half. So even if you got it right, but it took you too long, there's gotta be another way to do it, all right? So when you practice, it's not only about getting that question right, but it's about reviewing the rule in its entirety. So whatever that rule is, put the pen to the paper. The more senses you engage when you study, that's how you remember this mass volume of information. So it's not just about reading and watching lectures. Put the pen to the paper. What you write, you will remember and speak it. Engage those senses. I'm not a big fan of study groups if you're fooling around, but if you're serious and you're the tax guru and I'm the audit guru, hey, I'll share my knowledge with you. And by talking and explaining something to somebody else, you know who gets the most benefit out of that? The person doing the explaining because you're reinforcing your own. If you're out on a date, which you should not be, Get off that Tinder. That's only going to hinder your performance, man. But if you go out on a date, talk to them about consolidations. If they're still there at the end of the date, you probably did find your soulmate. Either that or they need psychiatric help. Okay, tip number three. Simulate. What did we say about simulations? You have to work the simulations, folks. Watching the lectures and doing the multiple choice, and then you don't apply that to simulations, a recipe for a disaster exam day. Pete will say, I knew that topic inside and out. I thought I could just 
translate that knowledge to task-based simulations. Not the case, folks. The task-based simulations, like I said, even if it's open book, oh my God, this they gave me an income statement, a balance sheet. They gave me all these notes, all these different exhibits. And then I got six or seven questions, 10 questions attached. You're gonna learn the right way to take that knowledge and apply it to this long problem. And I like to call it legalized cheating. I never start with the facts or the or the or the uh, or the uh, the uh, the what do they call it again? I just called it Quinn. What what word am I looking for? The uh, the uh, exhibits. You don't read that crap. It may have they love giving surplus information, distractor information that has no bearing on the solution. You start with the questions first, and then the light bulb is going to go up. Oh, they want me to calculate pension expense. What's my my formula? They want me to cal calculate the ending balance for the projected benefit obligation. What's my formula? Then you'll cherry pick the relevant information and then it'll be a lot easier to navigate that map. We do simulations with you. Sometimes we mess with you where all the exhibits and stuff have no bearing on the solution. The individual questions themselves are sufficient to answer that task-based simulation. You must practice the simulations, but after you've done the multiple choice. Tip four, Matt, tip four. All right. How do you remember this stuff exam day? Cumulative reviews, baby. If you're spending two or three months studying, you can't study something in week one and then not look at it again until you do your final review. Out, out of sight, out of mind. Every two to three weeks before you take a step forward, you take a step back and you do a cumulative review. How do you do a cumulative review? You redo the multiple choice questions you got wrong the first time around and the first time around, you might randomly select questions because there might be 200 questions on inventory. Do you need to do all 200 up front? Absolutely not. Maybe you'll do every other question or every third question. And then when you do your cumulative review, repeat what you got wrong the first time. And then you'll go back and answer some of those questions you didn't do the first time around. If you're not doing cumulative reviews, out of sight, out of mind. In regulation, before you move on to business law, you better do a thorough review of all those tax topics before then you start diluting your knowledge by now absorbing all the business law. It's a back and forth approach, man. That's the best way to retain this information. Next tip. All right. As I mentioned, folks, the uh, final review or your last two weeks before you take the exam, this is when you do a minimum of three practice exams. The practice exams are not even there really. It's incidental reviewing the concepts. By the time you get to this final lap, you should feel really good about the content, but now it's about allocating that four hours. 50%, two hours to multiple choice, two hours for your task-based simulations. How much time you're spending on Tesla one, Tesla two, and then Tesla three, four, and five. You've got to practice that. And look, Nobody runs a marathon the day before the marathon. You can't do your final exams, you know, the practice exams the day before the exam. You'll burn yourself out. Generally, the first three or four days after you've completed your studies, no new information. Now you're in the review mode. The first three or four days, you're in review mode. Then you take a practice exam. Then the next day or that day and the next day, you'll review it. Hey, oh, wow. Because if you find a problem and say, wow, I thought I knew bonds inside and out. I can't believe it. I got a lot of bond questions wrong. If you're studying, if you're doing your practice exams the day or two before the exam, what are you going to do about it now? So you got to leave yourself enough time that if you find a problem, you could do something about it. OK, but that final lap, man, that's I, and by the way, when you choose a location that's secondary to the date, the date supersedes everything. Don't take a date because it's got the location. You No, 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 no. The date, I never met anyone that says, oh, I was more prepared last week. I, everyone I meet that fails with a 72, 73 says, oh, if I only had a couple more days. So look, if you're not ready, push that exam out so you can get the date you want. When in doubt, push it back, give yourself extra time. You'd rather go from an 80 to an 85 than get yourself a 73 or 74 because you rush the time because of the location. Next slide, my last one. Build endurance, man. Listen, this is a big freaking deal. This whole TikTok generation, and I can't sit down for more than five minutes. And blah, 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 blah. It's a four hour damn test. When the hell was the last time you sat down? Four hours uninterrupted, not looking at your phone, no email, no text, no TikTok, no Instagram, no nothing. You can't get a single question wrong exam day because you're mentally fatigued. You got to save your wrong answers for stuff flat out you don't know. So you can't build that up in a day or two days. It's over the months in which you study. I'm a big fan of, look, initially when you study, 
you might be hard pressed to sit down for 15 or 30 minutes uninterrupted. But as we get to two to three weeks before the exam, you should have no problem sitting down four hours uninterrupted practicing and working questions and work those practice exams and exam conditions. Like, you know, you know, you get one break where they shut the clock off, but after every test that they'll say you want to take a break, the answer is absolutely not. Even if you got to go to the bathroom, your answer is absolutely not because you've already practiced studying in a diaper. So this way, God forbid you got to go to the bathroom, you're not going to get up. You're just going to do what you got to do right there and screw everybody else up because it's not going to smell so good in the room. But that's okay. You just keep rocking that exam, all right? Damn, let's go, baby. All right, Quinn, it's on you, baby. I'm turning it over to you. Let's go. Oh, Quinn, you're on mute. Okay, should be off mute. Got it. You guys hear me okay? Awesome. Peter, thank you. On behalf of the world team, just delighted to make sure we kind of run you through now that we've talked about the exam and the tips to get you ready for it. Let's take a look at the CPA review program. Next slide, Mad. Setting yourself for success, you need a dynamic set of instructors, and that's what we've got. It's a one-two punch. It's a Batman and Robin. It is Roger Phillip, and it is Peter Alento who together literally have led many hundreds of thousands of CPAs through their journey successfully. If you like high energy, you like relatability, you like a level of passion that is going to break down the concepts for you and then give you the tips on what to prepare you for the exam itself, that's what you're gonna get. Now, if you like them, you're gonna love what we've got next because they are part, next slide please, Mad, part of a cadre of talent check it out we've got a dozen subject matter experts and while many of them um, are now in academia this diverse set of subject matter experts all started in what pete public accounting these folks have actually done the work okay they've gone the same journey that you have they are going to be able to teach you in the same first person this is not lecture reading this is not reading out of the book this is talking to you about the concepts and relating them to you in the same way that you often benefit, benefited from a quality instructor relationship and uh, the higher education experience, which ironically, many of them are right now. This is the best of the best. So we bring them to you. They're gonna talk to you about their specific areas of expertise. That's what you've got. So welcome to the new cadre of portfolio of talent. We've got, we've got them here, subject matter experts at UWorld. Okay, so what's on the exam? Let's make sure we got a new exam. What are we gonna be tested on? Well, we took a really pragmatic and a very clear approach at UWorld. We came up with basically lifting the exact blueprints that came from the AICPA, which delineate the topics, the skill, and we broke them into the tasks. Literally, this is the blueprint from the AICPA. Let me show you what we've done in UWorld. We've literally captured these as representative tasks. So when you come into the UWorld program, next slide, you will see a one-to-one -one ratio of these blueprints mapped out for you as representative tasks, also very cleanly delineating for you what we're being asked to do and the skill level. So you take a look at an application question, uh, that could be a multiple choice, but analysis, likely to be a task-based simulation. No question about what is going to be on the exam. No question about your area of focus. And guess what? If you like it in the ebook, this is being reinforced by those lecturers. They're gonna open up their lectures talking about the representative tasks and breaking it down for you. So you have a one-to-one -one ratio between hearing it, watching it from the instructors, and then also seeing it in the ebook here. So whatever your learning style is, We've got you covered, no question about what's on the exam, what type of question am I gonna get? We've got you covered here at UWorld. All right, number next. Oh, the secret to the sauce. Let's talk about the UWorld difference and how we actually present our questions. So here it is, we've now gone into a different interface. We're replicating the Prometric um, interface. So we're actually, you're gonna practice how you're gonna be assessed great benefit here we've selected an answer and you'll notice really closely if you come all the way in and you look you'll see little percents after every answer response what's going on here okay these are telling us 
for the areas that have come over from the previous exam for candidates that passed the exam the first time, how many of them selected each of these answer responses? Why is this important? Well, what are we aiming for? We want to aim for not content mastery of a huge, huge Q bank. We want to level set and benchmark against those that have passed the exam the first time. And that's exactly what you've got here. More importantly, as you're learning and you're kind of trying to calibrate those areas that you understand and those that you really need more work on, these percents will help tell you, hey, I'm really close. Or in Pete's case, maybe sometimes the wheels are off the tracks, whatever. You get to see that gradation with those responses. You always can count on a very clear delineation and explanation. So if we go to the next slide. Every single answer response is then going to build into, keep going here, there we go, a definition, an illustration, an in-depth explanation, and I love this, a really clear delineation of why every answer is incorrect, with a key takeaway of things to remember to give us a capstone of the concept. Now, from this experience, especially in the case where we're really struggling, we've got a direct link right back into those lectures that we were talking about before. Wonderful way, if you're an active learner, if you like to experience multiple senses, if you're a person that likes a variety of illustrations and concepts broken out to you in a very consistent, pithy manner, that's what we do in New World. This is research-based learning, folks. It's just applied. So it's going to help you. And next slide. Everything that you do in this program ends up where? Check this out. In the Smart Path. This is your individualized results mapped out by the number of questions you've done and how you're performing on them on a topic by topic basis. More importantly, these are benchmark against what? People that pass the exam the first time. If you look closely, you'll see these little green targets and it's literally showing you the scores on average. So in this case, basic concepts and financial statements if you squint in there, I think you can see it's 89%. That's the average score and the number of questions. It's not that you have to take the whole QBank. It's that you have to take the right amount of questions at the right performance level. And guess what? All The more that you do, the more responsive and prescriptive the system becomes. So if you're on target, you're hitting all greens, you got a green mark. You need a little help. You're doing the right amount of exercises, but not quite at the right level. That's right, you got to need some improvement. And if you're doing the work, but you're not scoring at the right level, it's an area that you have identified, I need to double down, I need to go through those additional learning assets, maybe watch the videos again, maybe listen to the videos. This is going to clearly identify for you every single place where you need to double down and put additional time and allow you to also fast track through those areas that you're showing proficiency. Again, we're not asking you to master a whole, whole entire test bank. We're asking you to level set your performance against those that have passed the exam the first time. Ooh, quick, take a I breath. I want to add to that real quick. So unlike, you know, it's not like, hey, you have to watch every single lecture and you have to do every single question in the Q bank. Otherwise, you're not going to be prepared for the exam. No, that 94% pass rate is coming far more efficiently because it's about your specific background. It's a sliding scale on the volume of questions and then your performance on those questions. So you might have to work a, a, a much uh, you know, smaller uh, a, a volume of questions if you're doing really well on those questions you work. Conversely, if you're not doing as well, then the volume goes up, but you're not unnecessarily spinning your wheels on topics where you've mastered because somebody says, hey, for you to pass, you gotta work every single question and watch every single lecture and do all this stuff, obviously, mm -hmm. You know that that's going to work but the goal is to do it more in a more time efficient manner based upon your background and your specific performance on those questions and that's exactly what the smart path does maps it out for you individually so the other thing that we've got for you is all right how do i organize this and how do i kind of align my study plan to my timeline and time management skills so now let's keep on going to the next slide here so in conjunction with the SMART Path, we get to lay out our individualized study plan. What's going to work for us? So literally on the left-hand side here, you've got a sliding scale of how many hours can you study each day? So Monday, I've got three down. Tuesday, I'm going a little heavier with five. 
And this is adjustable. So as we accommodate our work and life schedules, especially through the upcoming season, we can edit this down as we want to kind of clear the decks on our work and start to prioritize our studying at later points in the, the summer, perhaps, we can scale this up. And it's going to always retrofit the content back to our desired test date. In this case, it happens to be March 17th. Now, once you do this, and again, you can edit at any time, you get to see this just like we do in our regular work lives. Here's my calendar view. Whatever I have lined up on this week, this month, and more prescriptively, this day. Everything you do in this program and you set up in your study planner, guess what? It now becomes the opening screen that you see with your daily tasks. Really cleanly marked, just like you see here. Green check marks done, red check marks, we've got to do them. So don't worry about, um, you know, what do I need to focus on first? What's next? Am I on track? We've got you covered at UWorld. And if you like what you see, oh, when, go ahead. One thing I was just going to mention too is I know with you know a lot of, for a lot of years um, a lot of students they get really nervous about the content right and I know Peter talked a lot about the content and what you're going to see and how, how long ago did you see it and I think it's really important to remember that a lot of times when we survey candidates after their exam um, it's time management that actually is what trips them up right, right? so you, you don't want to take that for granted so with both the study or the smart path and the study planner it's going to ensure that not only are you mastering the content in the actual course with the lectures and questions and videos, but this is also going to complement that to really make sure you have a good time management plan. It's the last thing you want is for the time management to get out ahead of you. Right. Being organized is going to help you win. It's going to set up a daily strategy that's going to help you win on a day to day, week to week. Overall, you, you've got it. I couldn't agree more. And this is a great, wonderful, flexible tool that you can apply. Now, if you like what you see, we've got something for you. So let's kind of move on over to the next one. This is the entire package. We'd love to work with you, whether you're at a university and in Shar's world or you're at a firm or business, my world, we'd love to partner with you. And we've got exclusive partnerships and many partnerships already established with nearly 200 firms. So if you're interested in learning more, of course, you can always come to uworld.com um, and We'd also love to get your information. And if you'd like to have Pete either come to the firm or learn more information about having Pete visit via webcast or one of our other subject matter experts, just go ahead and we're gonna move to this next slide. So you can click on the QR code, tell us a little bit about yourself and how we might partner either with your college, university or your firm or business. So as you're clicking on the QR code, also just wanna encourage you to Ask your questions. I'm sure, Mad, you're probably queuing those up right now. I think we've got a couple extra minutes for Pete to share his insights on any questions that may be out there. But on behalf of the entire U World team, Peter Alento, Charlotte Roberts, and myself, Quinn Perkson, thank you so much. We love doing these. We hope you find them as benefit and value. And we look forward to partnering and hearing from you soon. Thanks, Quinn. And yes, you are correct. We do have some questions that have come in uh during the presentation we do have a team that has been answering your questions typing in questions for you but we put aside a few that we thought would be helpful to the greater group here um to begin with one one person mentioned that they noticed that there was less content in their odd course and they're wondering if that means that that section is um, less difficult yeah, so it's it's a combination of the volume of information, right? As well as uh, you know, within that, you know, within those topics, how difficult the questions are. You know, it's interesting. Um, the good news with audit, again, no math involved, but the bad news with audit, there's no math involved. I, I like the math because it's very objective. It either uh balances that balance sheet or it doesn't. Whereas those audit questions could be very challenging, especially if you don't have that work experience. So I don't want you to get overconfident. Um, but I do think that, uh, you know, your performance on the multiple choice is going to dictate your path and your number of hours. So you'll set out initially what you budgeted, budgeted. But as Quinn mentioned, the great thing about the study planner is that's flexible and dynamic, because if you're doing better than you thought, well, hey, you know what, you might be ready a little bit sooner. Conversely, if you're not doing as well as you thought, but your performance is going to be what it is based upon the feedback we give you on the multiple choice and the task-based simulations. But yeah, there is a correlation certainly between the volume of information 
and uh, the amount of time you should uh, anticipate in putting into studying for that section of the exam. Great, thank you. Um, okay, next question. Is the 30 month window 100% approved effective as today? I think we kind of covered that. <laughs> that slide was no, no, no such thing. 50 states and jurisdictions on top of that. No, 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 unfortunately not. So everything is state specific. The vast majority of states have approved it, but all 100%? No, absolutely not. So uh, offline, if you want to reach out to us about a particular state, we'd be happy to send you to our state expert, we'll tell you where they are in that process. Look, it's not a NAS AICPA and NASBA are all for it, but the license is granted by a state. So the legislative process has to go through. Some states have done it faster than others, but we could tell you the specific state you might be interested in. We'll connect you with the state expert and uh, get you a little bit more detailed feedback, but no, nothing's 100%. Yeah. Right. I, I, if I may too, Matt, I would also um, add to it that we partner with most of the state societies across the nation and they are heavily invested in educating everyone and keeping everyone the most informed with specifically what is happening in their state. So I would also recommend um, if you're not a member of your state society and or go to their website, check it out there too. I think they're also putting a lot of information um, if there's some excitement going that it did pass within the state and they have turned to a 30 hour or a a 30 month rule. And, and you know, also, what, like I said, if all things being equal, if your employer is neutral about it, and, um, you know, you shopping for a state, right? That's one of the things you might want to consider because the 30 month is so far more appealing than the 18 month window. Great. Thank you. So there's a lot of questions. I know we covered all the different uh, disciplines, but still, there's a lot of questions about how do I choose my discipline. Um, one person wrote, so I love both IT, accounting, and taxes. If I choose to sit for ISC, do I have to go the audit career path route? It seems like ISC is related to auditing. No, no, no. There's no have to, folks. There's no have to. And look, a lot of this is, you know, you're going to change over time, right? I, I went from, you know, accounting to law and what have you. So, no, you're a yeah, CPA, still a CPA. It's just that all things being equal, if you think, you know, this is a much easier decision, right, for people who have two to three year work experience where they know for sure I'm going the audit path or the tax path. But if you're in school and you're unsure, no, you know what, whatever you think, you know, and then I would break it down if all things being equal. You know, what subject matter uh, do you find most interesting and would you most want to learn more about, right? And did you have a higher mm -hmm. probability of passing if you're interested in that subject matter? But this is not an easy decision for folks who are still in school and haven't worked yet and your career can and will change. That's why the AICPA has gone out of their way to say, just because you take the tax TCP does not mean now you're a special type of tax CPA and that doesn't exclude you from going the audit route or vice versa. But if you're going to do an internship, forget about choosing the internship over a few bucks difference. What what firm is giving you an opportunity during that internship to actually see both tax and audit? So now you can make an informed decision as to what you think you might like based upon right? It's like dating, right? I see somebody online. They look pretty good. You meet them in person. You're like, ah. So, you know, you want to have that actual opportunity to do the work, but you could switch, folks. You could switch. It's just guidance that all things being equal, more likely than not, audit route, you know, the ISC or the bar, tax TCP, but it's not locked in stone. One of the things I would recommend to Madeline for folks that are still trying to figure out which discipline to pick, you know, especially if you've narrowed it down to two, is I would highly recommend you to try out our free trial where you can sample all three of the disciplines. Because I know that Pete shared some great information about potential career paths and your interest. But I think if you're still feeling in the theoretical and having trouble narrowing it down, get in. Go to the free trial, practice some of the questions, look at how the material is presented. And I think once you get in and actually start sampling it, I think that's really going to seal the deal and you're going to see which area you feel like you're going to perform best in as far as your discipline on the CPA exam. And if you're in school and you're going to the meet the firms night, talk to potential employers about, hey, you know, here are the three disciplines. Where is there a need? Like what, you know, especially if you're talking to somebody who's not just an HR, but they're a practitioner themselves, like where do you see the most opportunity? Because if you're relatively indifferent about these things, you obviously want to go to a place that pays more, that has more opportunity, et cetera. Do your due diligence, right? Find out career paths, what kind of money they make, what kind of hours they work. So that could influence your decision as well. Great. 
Okay, so here's a, there's still a lot of confusion about the new testing windows. Um, one person asked if they can, it, I know in the past that uh, you would pass, if you didn't pass within that window, you couldn't retake within that window. Is that still true with this new testing window? By necessity, test? it's not like the old exam, uh, going back three or four years ago when they gave the exam in a certain quarter, you couldn't retake in that quarter but you had the opportunity to do so because you got your results so quickly two or three weeks later that you could potentially retake in that quarter. For right now, it's a moot point because you ain't getting your results in that same quarter. You're not receiving them until the next quarter. So there's no prohibition because it's not even a possibility right now because of the delay in getting your score. So uh, going forward in 2025, That'll be an interesting question. We'll see how they'll do it. Because originally they went from, if you sit in a quarter, you can't retake in a quarter, to the past few years has been, if you've taken it in a quarter, got your results quickly and want to retake in the same quarter, then they said you could do it. We're not at that point yet with this new exam because it's it's not even an option yet. Right. And then also, um, if there's advice on... Well, I, I mean, basically you, you covered this because the question is, that what, what do I do if I don't pass? But you won't yeah. even know that until. Right. You get, it takes so long for you to get your results that don't wait. The worst thing you could do is say, I'm not going to study for my next part until I get my results because there's a delay of multiple months here that you're losing. Don't let that happen. You take that right. part, you hope for the best, you know, you take a few days off and whenever you plan on studying for your next part, jump in because you're going to be two months into that by the time you get results for that other part. So that's why I said earlier, if you fail a part, but you started studying for your next part, don't worry about that part you failed. We'll deal with that, but continue with the part you've been studying with and then call us, talk to us. We'll put together a study plan with you and say, okay, no worries. You got your results. Let's look at that score report because they break it down by multiple choice versus task-based simulation. They'll break it down by individual subject matter. So we'll put together a study plan, but predominantly the second time around, that's where you want to flip your approach. And rather than starting with the lectures and then go into the multiple choice, you're probably going to start more with the multiple choice task-based simulations and then only rewatch lectures where you were really deficient, okay? So, but we'll help you do that. But I just don't want you to get discouraged by that because most people don't pass all four the first time because of lack of time. You're going to school, you're working, whatever. It's okay, it's not a big deal. Okay, thank you. So we have one time for just one more question. We're already over time. So this last question, um, depending on which discipline you choose, how does that change the order of your exam? Okay, so one more time, general rule of thumb, holding all things constant. If you think you're going the audit route, you're gonna get audit training and audit work experience. Therefore, the audit section core, and then either the, T, uh, the IT or the bar, I would leave those two for last. I would do the core audit, third, and then fourth, you're either going to go the IT route or the bar route. If you're going the audit track, what you're not going to be doing day in, day out is uh, regulation, right? Your tax. So you want to do tax first or second, and then financial accounting first or second, because it's so voluminous. Again, as I mentioned earlier, hardest one in, first one out. So if you're an audit person, let's get the financial and tax out of the way, because that's going to be very academic. You're not going to get training on that. The longer you're out of school, the harder that'll be to pass. If you think you're going the tax route, then you're either going to do financial or audit first, probably financial because it's more math intensive, needs more time to study for, and you've got no time constraint. You'll probably do your financial, then your audit. And then if you go in the tax route, it makes sense to do the core tax first, the fundamentals, et cetera, and then your TCP, your leave for last. Right. So that I, I do think that's a really important that more than anything, you don't want to take your y discipline prior to taking that core. You always want yeah, to set that foundation. That somebody would do that. There's always the possibility, rare exception, depending upon recent classes you've taken and preference for topics. But that would be the exception more than the rule. And Matt, before we go, I have to say one thing to this group. Uh, you know, a lot of you know me. I've been in the industry for multiple decades. I was with another review course. I really want to encourage you all. This changes the rest of your life. 
you've got we we shop around for the silliest of things, clothing, shoes, cars, whatever. That's not going to change your life. Passing or not passing this exam will. We encourage you. Listen, what people took two years ago or just a year ago is very different than what that course may be today. We have the confidence in our product to say, hey, man, before you do anything, put us side by side, man. See the way it's explained, the way it's presented, the way they go through the examples, and see the course that's best for you. Because when you talk to people that say, hey, I took so-and-so three years ago or five years ago, or I'm a partner, I took that 15 years ago, that course may be totally different today. All right, so take the time. Please do your due diligence. We welcome that competition. We want that side by side because if you choose the course that's best for you, you're more likely going to succeed. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Pete. Thank you, everyone, okay. Charlotte Quinn, and yeah. all that joined today. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Have a great Friday and happy studying. Happy studying. Good luck, folks. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you in class. Hopefully, God bless you. Good luck.